Today, I'm going to talk to you in more detail about the branches of linguistics that we cover here at Hadford. There are seven main branches: phonetics, phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, pragmatics, and sociolinguistics. I will focus on three of these branches, which will be covered this term. Firstly, there is phonology, the study of sounds in speech and how they are used. Secondly, there is morphology, the branch which studies the structure or forms of words. Thirdly, there is syntax, which investigates the ordering of words. Collectively, these three branches are often called microlinguistics. Let's look first at phonology, which studies how sounds are organized and used in language. The phoneme plays a key role here. The word phoneme was created in 1876 by the Polish academic Jan Bodwar de Courtenay, whose work is considered to be the foundation of what we now know as phonology. Phonemes are meaningless sound units which language users put together to form meanings. Listen to speakers of different languages, and you will note quite quickly that different tongues use different ranges of sounds. The main aim of phonology is to understand the rules of how these meaningless phonemes are combined in order to represent meaning in a particular language. In practice, a phonologist examines the sound patterns of a particular language by identifying the phonetic sounds and trying to clarify the way in which speakers interpret these sounds. At least one of your sessions will be in the language laboratory. Dr. Bodsworth will be teaching this module in the first half of this semester. You will need to have access to a dictaphone or a digital voice recorder for your first assignment. Now, let's move on to morphology. Morphology studies the structure of words. In fact, the term was first used by the great German poet Johann Wolfgang Goethe to describe the study of the structure of animals and plants. In years to come, it was used to describe the area of grammar that investigates the structure of words. The German August Schleicher was the first linguist to describe languages in terms from biology. In living organisms, separate cells form tissues which form organs, which in turn form systems. In language, phonemes combine to form meaningful sounds. Morphemes or bits of words combine to form whole meaningful words. Syntactic units like nouns and verbs and adjectives combine in rule-governed ways to form sentences. It's easy to see why Schleicher started to see the similarity between languages and living organisms. I've just mentioned syntactic units. The third branch of linguistics that you will be studying at the end of this semester is syntax. This looks at the way words come together. It focuses on how different words are ordered into clauses and how clauses join to make sentences. Syntax can have an important impact on communication. For example, the position of a verb in a sentence can mean the difference between a statement and a question. If you get that wrong, it could cause a lot of trouble and misunderstanding in some situations. Different languages have very different rules of syntax. In this lecture, I'm going to discuss motor aphasia, or the loss of the power to articulate speech through brain damage. In general English, a motor means a machine which moves or powers something. Of course, the brain isn't really a machine. However, under certain circumstances, people can experience trouble performing the motor or output aspects of speech. I'm now going to look at the causes of motor aphasia and the effects. Aphasia is caused when one or more of the brain's language areas is damaged. Sometimes injury to the brain is the result of a stroke. A stroke happens when blood is unable to get to part of the brain. If the usual supply of blood is stopped, then brain cells can die. Aphasia can also be caused by serious injuries to the head and by other types of brain damage. As a result of motor aphasia, structures for language production are damaged. Motor aphasia is also sometimes called Broca's aphasia. This is because the damaged area of the brain is named after Paul Broca, 
who is best known for his work in neurology, or the scientific study of the nervous system. Broca researched the functions of the brain during the 19th century. People who suffer from this type of aphasia are often unable to speak at all, or they might be able to use only single words. Patients with Broca's aphasia often also suffer from depression because they know they have language problems. And by the way, scientists have found that gorilla brains don't have Broca's area. That is one reason why they can't use language like we do. OK, are we all ready? Right, I'll begin. I'm often asked, how did English become global? The answer is that the process began as soon as it arrived in England in the 5th century, having travelled from continental Europe. In this lecture, we're going to look at the impact that English as a global language has had on the world. First, I'm going to mention some key dates in the spread of English. Then I'll describe how English has developed and been influenced since its origin. So, let's look at the spread of English. The language first came to England in the 5th century with the Angles and Jutes. Between the 5th and 11th centuries, it made its way to Cornwall, Wales, Cumbria and the south of what is now Scotland. In these areas, English met the traditional Celtic languages. Many people from the English upper class also took the language to Scotland, as they left England after the invasion of the Normans in 1066. English made its way to Ireland in the 12th century. From the 16th century on, England was emerging as an imperial nation, and as the British Empire grew, so did the spread of English. So, English is a well-travelled language. On its way, it has developed through contact with other languages and cultures. English still has many grammatical similarities with German because of the shared roots of the two languages. After its arrival in England in the 5th century, it was influenced by the Celtic languages of Britain. It also took many words from the Vikings who invaded England before the Norman Conquest in 1066. The arrival of the Normans in the 11th century introduced French as the language of government and made a deep impact on the English language. From the 15th century onwards, words came into the language from Latin and Greek. Then a whole range of influences came with the British Empire. Today, in the 21st century, email and word processing software make it easy for the written language to travel great distances in very short spaces of time. British English is perhaps most influenced by American English. Many British people find this hard to accept. However, because of the power of the USA, the process is likely to continue. This week, I'm going to talk about how it all began. Who were the first true linguists? When did linguistics begin? We'll start with Panini in India in the 5th century BCE. You will also see that there were many developments before Europeans began to analyze their languages in the 14th century. As I said earlier, Panini is one of the first linguists. Panini lived in India in the 5th century BCE. He was interested in the structure of words, including prefixes and suffixes. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, first examined sentence parts in the 4th century BCE. Two centuries later, another Greek, Thrax, led one of the first real grammatical studies. However, it wasn't until the 6th century CE that the Greek influence reached the Romans. Other Europeans waited until the 14th century to start analyzing their languages, and it was not until after 1799, when the French discovered the Rosetta Stone, that people finally learned how to decode the meaning of Egyptian hieroglyphs. We have come a long way in a short period of time when you think that we now have access to electronic dictionaries and computer translation websites. In this week's lecture, I'm going to consider the functions of language. There are five main functions which are common to all languages. Firstly, social interaction, a way of easing relationships with others. Secondly, recording of facts, 
a means of storing information for future use, usually in written form. Thirdly, emotional expression, a way of expressing how we feel, including opinion and emotions. Fourthly, expression of identity, a way for a group of people who share similar views to show their similarity. Fifthly, and finally, naming the world, a way of taking note and making sense of our environment. Last week, we defined language and linguistics. Today, we're going to compare animal and human communication. Some people would argue that language is a uniquely human characteristic, and others would say that a number of other species also use a form of language. Although there is some similarity between animal and human communication, there are also crucial differences which make human language distinct. Firstly, we'll look at the similarities and then at the differences. Finally, we'll see how these differences form a type of communication which is inaccessible to any other species. OK. The five functions of language. Now let's consider social interaction first. This is a way of easing relationships with others. Language is used to help build relationships or bridges between people. For example, a group of schoolchildren using a type of slang common to young people might be building friendships within their group. Secondly, recording of facts. Now, this is information stored for future use. Such stored facts are necessary for the development of society. They help us to pass on information as well as to organize facts and data. We use language in this way to teach and learn. Thirdly, Emotional expression. We use language in this way to explore how we think and feel about ourselves and the world around us. People have long been fascinated with the concept of interspecies communication. The prefix inter means between and species means different kinds of animals. The similarities between animal and human communication can be found in the definition of the word communication itself. Communication includes the use of both signals and symbols. Signals are noises or gestures that have a clear meaning. They usually mean just one thing. They are used in the same situation every time. Animal and baby cries or laughing are a good example of signals in both humans and animals. So there is a common ground. Both animal and human communication contains signals. On the other hand, human communication also uses symbols. Symbols consist of sounds or gestures that have different meanings for different groups of people. Symbols need to be learnt and can have different meanings in different situations. For Charles Hockett, an important contemporary linguist, the most significant feature that marks human language is duality of pattern. Duality of pattern is the ability to make an unlimited number of meaningful words out of a limited amount of meaningless sounds. Animal communication does not have duality of pattern.